a social entrepreneur. Really, it's just ordinary people that have seen a problem that isn't being fixed. I always felt from the start that there were people way better than me that could do this job. And then somebody told me, there probably is somebody better than you to do it, but they're not doing it. You are. It really is just taking action to actually make it a reality. You get one project across the line and people say, wow, he's not a lunatic. <laughs> it does actually work. All across this little country, there are people with big ideas that are changing Ireland, from housing to health to social isolation. There are projects led by social entrepreneurs that are having a very positive impact on countless people's lives. One big idea that is changing lives is men's sheds. A men's shed is a social space where men come together to learn, share skills and make new friends. In Kilbegan Men's Shed, one of over 450 sheds in Ireland, the members have some fun planned for apple season. <laughs> We're going to have an apple party. An, an apple? <laughs> yeah. i tell you what we'll do, we'll put it up in the pallet. Let me think now. Yeah, put it up in the pallet. On the menu today, if you like, it's, it's October. It's apple time of the year. So basically what we do is we go around to the local orchards, anybody that's willing to give us apples, and we'll juice the apples there. And at a later date then, we'll have a community juicing day. Last year we did it for a defibrillator for Kilbegan. Oh, this horse was in there. Have you the end on that? I thought it was in. Mick will tell you. Have you the end for that? <laughs> <laughs> Each week, Sean and his bazooki get a lift to the shed from his wife, Mary. Mary? Some days he's perfect and some days he's just... When he, when he goes down, it's hard to bring him back up. Okay. He, he doesn't think he has the match, even though he was told several times. Right. He just that there's something wrong with him, he thinks. Okay. He gets tired. Any hard to ask you, were you watching the Brendan Grace? Oh, I loved it, yeah. Sure, he loved it. I kept mentioning the mention, they all have dementia. Yeah, he says, you'd have. You'd know they had. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, oh, thinking that it might just click into click, his brain yeah. that he is the same, but no, it didn't. Didn't? No. Yeah, but you see the part on, on Hal Roach? That's right, and his wife. Yeah. Ah, uh, that was Old horrible. Yeah, and yeah. they're not knowing each other. Yeah. Oh. But knowing that th there was a connection. It, yeah. But not knowing what the not connection was. Not knowing what the connection was. No, that was... Oh. That was sad. Yeah. That hit me now. I was saying, this is going to be Sean after a while. Oh well. You're a great woman. But you look at it, can anyone do it? No, you're a great woman. No, anyone do it. I, I, that's the way I look at it anyway. But what are you going to do? Put them out the grass. <laughs> What's the chances of a bit of outdoor music? Yeah, I was thinking it might be a bad idea. Set you up here. Here's another chair there. Here you are, Sean. One for you. Sean. Yeah. Do you want to sing to put your legs up as well? You know the way we'll get. Hold well, on a second. <laughs> a reclining pallet. A retired pallet. Right, Johnny, away with it. Christy, you want a far side and help him. You can already see it without any squeezing, without any pressure. The juice of the apples. And the juice of the barley for oh, me. Down in water for Do an old toast there, Frank. As the, the toughers were burning, should I first saw the light. <laughs> and a drunken old skill. I went to Christy with Jay. As she danced round the floor with the skip of a bicing and bonion of moors to go and the juice of the apple for me. The men's shed has a hugely positive impact on families and communities, as well as on the men themselves. After his weekly visit to the shed in Kilbegan, Sean gets dropped home by his musician pal Mick. Were you playing outside today? No, oh, I was, yeah. Yeah. She's a daughter of mine and she's playing the, fiddle, playing the fiddle and or the banjo and uh, not the fiddle, really, not, no. No, not she yet. Didn't hear that yet. No. She wanted to learn it. Do what? Bright blue rose, it's in D. I skim across black water with a one submerging hand to the bank. Of an urban morning. I'm 
daddy's daughter. Sean got his daughter. And I actually run a crash that he built about 22 years ago down in Retro Bridge. And I'm very proud to be still holding a legacy farm. He's the most quiet and the most reliable and the most gentle. I think that's the biggest word that you have to use. Well, I think when the decision was kind of to what to do during the day, especially when his venture is progressing now at the minute, it's very hard where to go and you don't like dropping him off places that you don't feel he's happy. I think I rang, I don't know, I think it was about two years, nearly three years, I rang TP and I wouldn't have known him previous to this, I just heard of him and asked him about Dad starting in with them and he couldn't have been any more helpful on the phone. He actually came and met me and described what the men's shed was about. They, they can be whoever they want to be within them couple of hours and the stress of their lives is gone. They get to do their own thing. This is my, this is my band years ago, when I was, we were coming, when I was just finishing school. This was taken in the lake, Loch Ennell, running gar. Had his return, we called ourselves. We had a band. You may have heard of that, please. And this is my family here. Near all. That's Graham, he's in America. No, and that's, that's Neve. She has a crash of her own. Right? And this is, this is Orla here. Where yeah. are you? Yeah, that's me, yeah. yeah. And that's Neil. He, he's, um, he was, what, what did he do? He's Blocklair. Blocklair, yeah. yeah. Blocklair. It's hard to cope with it. And it's, he did say to me one day, Mary, I don't know what's going on in my head. I wish I could get that thing out of my head. And that's what really hurt me, broke my heart, because I can't do anything for him. So it's, I don't know. It's so, it's so tough, it's so hard. And how he got it, I never know, and nobody knows, for, for a man that was so, so active all his life. It was the best thing that ever happened, was to get him into the shed. When he's going in there, he just blooming when he comes home. He doesn't tell me much that goes on, but it'll come out in bits and pieces over the couple of days afterwards. He'll tell me about the dancing, and I think it's Frank that comes in and plays the fiddle. And Christy plays the accordion, but Christy dances as well. Mick accompanies him on the guitar and he loves that. He loves, just loves the guitar accompanying him the whole time. You have to be there with the guitar. He's so happy. I don't know what I would do if there was no such thing as the men's shed. Really, I don't know. It took, it took, took him out of himself and gave him a new lease of life. That's what I did do. Thank God for it. He was always building, building and building. And then when he did come home, he just kept building on here as well. So I think we've got seven sheds at the back and I think we're after having it about four extensions onto the house. He's mad to build another two crashes now at the minute. So that's, the plans are being drawn up for that. I don't think in his own head he'll ever, ever give up work. I have to sit back now at some stage anyway and relax a little bit because it might get me to a, little bit, a good bit, all right, yeah. But I won't, I won't give up music anyway, that's one thing. I can give up hurling, all right, but, but definitely not music. I come up here at night after I eat my dinner down below, I come up here, sit down there and start into songs and into playing. But like, when you start to sing, like, you, you might as well keep going with it anyway. Adam Harris's big idea is to make Ireland a more autism-friendly country. Adam grew up with Asperger's syndrome, and while he was still a teenager, founded As I Am, now a leading autism charity and advocacy organisation. Literally just moved in, so we still have a bit of tidying to do, but one of the key things we do as an organisation is we're trying to change how Irish society reacts and responds to autistic people, and to try and make it a much more understanding, inclusive space. Our actual kind of big vision is that Ireland will be the world's most autism-friendly country. 
we have to completely change how we look at autism. Instead of just talking about supporting the autistic person, we actually have to talk about how do we support society to change to include autistic people who adapt for a world that isn't built for us every day. So our training team does a huge amount of work in schools, in businesses, in universities, with public services like the Gardaí to give them the skills to be autism friendly. It started off just as a blogging platform, uh, originally called Asperger's Advice. I just wanted to share my experience growing up and try to, to reach some other people. But then just very quickly, what it began to emerge to me was the media narrative around autism, which was largely just about research or public policy. Completely missed so many of the other experiences and barriers people were having. Social isolation, bullying, um, lack of employment, mental health crises, that were so much to do with the societal response. We're really proud that half of our team are on the autism spectrum, so we're trying to make it as accessible and supportive an environment as possible. We put these sensory pods into all of the libraries in DCU as part of our Autism Friendly initiative, and they're really just a place people can go to if they become overwhelmed and need to calm down, need to have some quiet time. And one was very kindly donated to us for our own team to use. With their annual conference approaching, As I Am's team of youth ambassadors are meeting to discuss their roles in the event. The only difference between conference last year and conference this year is that this time you're speaking at it, <laughs> which is a pretty big difference. So day one is the professional development seminar. Basically anybody who works with autistic individuals or who might work with autistic individuals or who's studying. So would be a good place to bring a CV to get a job? I would say go for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why not? Do you know the breakout sessions that yeah. we do every mm -hmm. year? The first one is what I wish my teacher knew. So you want me to sort of talk about my experience in education and where I thought maybe there could be improvements and stuff like that? Absolutely. Okay. Voices of our community, day one it's about adopting a strengths-based approach. How you feel you can do well by somebody acknowledging what you're good at, what your strengths are. Um, so Adam, you're speaking at that? I, I know from listening to you that you'd be excellent at it. Uh, so basically it's uh, like uh, changing the way that people see uh, an autistic person. Yeah. It helps me uh, make friends who are like me. Do you want me to close the thing? Like just having those people to talk to, I mean, like, to just have that, like a space being held just for autistic people. Like that was amazing. Well, as I am has helped me a lot, helped me accept my disability. And also that I'm not the only one with autism, that I thought I was alone, whereas I'm not. I'm going off to college, you'd go back 10, 15 years and you thought maybe it was never going to happen. But uh, lo and behold, here I am. Ben's connection to As I Am goes all the way back to primary school. When I was 12 years old, a 17-year-old Adam Harris came in to speak to my primary school synchronous about autism. While I knew I had autism at this point, I didn't necessarily know a lot about it. The Cronin talk was a huge deal, but the biggest deal for me was when he, he spoke to the third year group. That was where it all kicked off for me. It took me a long, long while to settle into secondary. You know, my, my anxiety was very bad at, at that time, first year, second year. When I look sort of at my life with autism now, there was a time before that talk and there was a time after that talk. What I've seen around Ireland is people really want to do the right thing. And people, you know, primarily that's who we're dealing with. People, organisations, communities that come to us and say, we want to be inclusive. We want to improve how we treat autistic people who maybe we haven't always treated very well in the past. Companies are beginning to see we can't operate in a way that excludes one in 65 people in the community. Where I think though, unfortunately, there is still a blockage is very much in the state system, where we still have a situation where many government departments still persist in refusing to listen to autistic people's experiences and views, still continue to insist they know more about autism than the experiences of people who are growing up with the condition. When autistic people in a number of years' time become more included, become more accepted in society, this will be the big question people are wondering about, you know, on what side were various people in relation to that? People can choose to come with where we're all going, or they can try and lag behind, but it's inevitable that we will get there as I am, because this, this is me, as I am, and like I can't change. Like, there's so many autistic people who are like cutting off massive parts of themselves just to fit into a neurotypical society. And I used to like really stop myself from swimming because like, no, no, because that's too much of a public autism thing. I can't be that public with my autism, but lately it's like, 
you know what, I'm gonna go out, I'm gonna wear my stim jewelry, I'm gonna use it in public and I don't care anymore. If you're gonna watch, you're gonna watch. I'm autistic, deal with it. <laughs>to be able to go out and talk about things that otherwise you don't really have a place to talk about. Can any of you remember when you were in second or third year, if you'd have had a girl in sixth year or first year in college who would just be have that honesty that you girls all have mm -hmm. as well? Like what that might have meant to you? Yeah, definitely. I like really felt that way um, in like first and second year because I was like bullied um, in my class and it was always because I was like, really into like superheroes Me and like too. I used to like wear oh like oh. the fashion was not good. <laughs> no, not, but like I loved how I looked. Then in third year I like quietened down so much because I was like well what I have to say is obviously like stupid or whatever and like no one wants to hear it. The whole watering down of people. I see it all the time. Like, I was also like really badly depressed for three years. I had like no personality because I hated my personality so I had just nothing. And then I went on the Shona project. It made me realise it happens to probably way too many people than it should. Yeah. But also, it happens and it's okay. Mm. It's okay to feel that way. As a society, Ireland is still a little bit stuck in the ways of you shouldn't feel that way because it's selfish. I remember when I was depressed, especially people close to me would tell me it was uh, very selfish of me. I think that everyone says that everything has like, gotten really good, but I just don't think it has. And I think like in first year, for like 20 minutes of a 40 minute class, they talked about depression and it was literally just like, if you feel sad, you should go for a walk. Yeah. The end. Uh, sometimes people feel sad, but nobody here feels sad. Everyone here is fine, so don't come talk to me at the end of it because you're fine. For me personally, it took me like into my late 20s before all those things that I'd forgotten about myself came back again. Yeah. But for some, it never comes back. Mm -hmm. And all that potential is lost and what you said, watered down. Like when I was first diagnosed with an eating disorder, I didn't want anyone to know. Like my family or friends, I was like, this is embarrassing. I was like ashamed. And then when I found the Shona project, I was like, I'll just write an article, I'll just do it. And then when it was published and you get feedback, you're like, it's actually so many people struggle on like different levels. And you're like, why would you hide that? Because then everyone else is hiding it. I yeah. always try to get to these days because I feel more empowered leaving it. Yeah. yeah I feel like I've spoken about something that matters. You know, it's not small talk and it's yeah. not, yeah. you know, lunchroom talk. It's I want to go run yeah. for president or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually do. <laughs> will we go and get lunch then? <laughs> Nobody wants to know about teenage girls. They're this thing that's emotional and unstable and you just don't want to even go there and you don't want to even talk about it. And it's really hard to be a teenage girl then because you feel like everything you're saying is over dramatic or it's so stupid to worry about your weight, like that's so silly, that's such a teenage girl problem. It is actually genuinely really hard to go through that and you're not being over dramatic and you're not being silly. You're, you know what I mean? You're just trying to deal with it in whatever way you can. Yeah, but at the end of the day, you're probably just being over dramatic anyway. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> Here's what we're saying. <laughs> Barry Sheridan heads up the Irish Men's Shed Association and today he'll hit the road to launch a newly refurbished shed in County Monaghan. But first... What do you want in your bread? Butter and jam. Butter and jam. Yeah, so we invited this morning up to uh, Bally Bay in Monaghan. Um, we've got all our sheds in Monaghan come together. For me it's a great opportunity because you don't get an opportunity to visit every shed in the country. We've got over 450 sheds. 
men sheds really what they are a social space before men can come together share their experiences uh, meet new people uh, learn new skills share their own skills and at the same time giving back something to their community for the men they decide themselves what they'd like to do because sheds making honey you've got sheds building boats you've got sheds fixing bikes you've got sheds doing up old machinery you've got sheds literally you name it they're doing it we have this model within men sheds that men don't talk face to face but to do shoulder to shoulder and the unique environment is a shed is where that door is open and it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter where you're from or it doesn't matter what your background is you're going to be treated exactly the same as anyone else a team of probably seven in the office so having people on the ground is is a difficulty i'd love to have more bodies on the ground to be able to support the sheds this is great so this is the new space this is the new space yeah, yeah. This is a bit of an office we changed it right now. brilliant so this will be your workshop yeah two yeah. workshops two workshops oh, very good peter is the volunteer coordinator for all the men's sheds in county monaghan you know it's it's a place to go it's it's a place you can be without you know, without alcohol, without drugs, without any sort of outside interference like that, fellas can just get together, they can have a cup of tea, they can have a chat, they can get involved in a few projects and do things at their leisure. You know, you're not under pressure doing it. Like people who have been, you know, suffering maybe a wee bit of depression or feeling a wee bit down, maybe after a bereavement, maybe, you know, being unemployed for a length of time or whatever, they come in here and they, they, they have a worth that they might immediately feel other ways, like if they were sitting in the corner at home. Seven years ago, there was no sheds in Ireland. And to think that that has grown from zero sheds to 450 sheds. Recently there, the United Nations were onto us and they're looking at men's sheds as a project that should be shared all over the world. And they're looking at what's happened in Ireland as an example of that. You're part of something that's very, very important at a national level to Irish society. And I think you've got a huge role to play. That first day you walked into the shed, you were probably looking for something. And thankfully, hopefully, most of you have found that. I guarantee everyone here standing around here, within five, five miles of where you live, there's probably someone else that could benefit from a shed. And sometimes when you're in your shed, you don't think of it that way. But I guarantee you know someone else that could benefit from it. And sometimes it can be as simple as just saying to them at Mass or wherever you meet them and say, why don't you come down for a cup of tea someday? Just come down for a cup of tea. Because that's where it happens. Well, everybody has their own reason, yeah. In my case, I live on my own, you see, and it was a matter of getting up in the morning and have somewhere to go. Somewhere to talk to, maybe, or if you, you know, if you had a problem, you would get a hand with it. My wife passed on a few years back and I had absolutely nothing to do. And I'd seen an advertisement in our local paper and I just uh, went down one Saturday at an open day, went down and, uh, to see what it was about. Pass a word or two. You can come home that night and you're happy enough. You've been talking to somebody all day, then, you know. I love hearing new ideas. I love hearing what people are, t are trying to do. I love hearing the problems they're trying to solve. And, uh, you know, and not all them work, but not every business works either. So, you know, you take, the, you take it as it comes. So for people to kind of think, God, I'd like to do something better and I think I could do something better, but I don't know how to. There is people there that can help you through that bit. You know, every single person in this country has a little role to play to make the world a better place, you know, and that's nearly a, a bigger, more, um, international version of it, but what we're trying to do with the men's sheds and that piece is bring it down to local and make, and make it more uh, accessible and uh, for everyone, you know. Next time on Changing Ireland, My Big Idea, we see the impact that these ideas are having as we meet a group working to make DCU the world's first autism-friendly university, the people about to move into a Coulon's latest affordable homes and 800 teenage girls at a Shona project gathering in Waterford.